Welcome to the Barrier Breakdown, Disrupting Mental Health Podcast, where we talk about the clinical and practical issues that face those working in the mental health industry. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's episode of the Barrier Breakdown. My name is Erin Mullen O'Bailey, Chief Operating Officer at Cognitive Behavior Institute, and my co-host, Dr. Kevin Caridad, who is the CEO and owner of Cognitive Behavior Institute. This week, we are joined by our guest, Kapil Nayar. Kapil is a native to Philadelphia and is a licensed professional counselor with a forte in substance abuse disorder. When it comes to addiction treatment, Kapil has worked within the field in various nonprofit and for-profit treatment settings and currently practices in, pri- in a private practice setting. Kapil has been a source for grand jury investigations uh, with into various parts of the country, including Pennsylvania and Florida. He has been a force in patient advocacy, social justice, and really trying to hold accountable corrupt fraudulent treatment facilities. So Kapil, we greatly appreciate you being here with us right now uh, on the Barrier Breakdown. And can you tell us a little bit about how you became interested in uh, substance abuse specifically when working within mental health? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, It's an honor to be here. Um, uh, So the short of it is um, it happened by accident. Uh, I initially wanted to be a psychiatrist. I was in medical school for a bit, kind of rerouted, uh, and my trajectory landed me at LaSalle University. So I completed a master's in clinical counseling psych. And ever since graduating, I just, um, my my first employment was substance use disorder treatment and kind of fell in love with it. And that's kind of where it all took off. Awesome. Awesome. Now I know that, um, I know that you, uh, have an interest in combating fraud. Can you tell us a little bit about that? And can you tell us about some of your experience? Because I think our listeners, um, having clients who, um, have gone to inpatient facilities, especially for substance abuse, will find this extremely interesting. Yeah, absolutely. So, I I mean, I feel like everyone is kind of aware of what brokers were in the past and the negative connotation that they received. Current day marketing practices, I mean, I speak to marketers across the country and they kind of say that they are kind of a glorified, newly derived construct of a broker. Um, And I think here and now we're in this carcinogenesis where the entire industry is moving towards this this for profit, profit over people type ideology. and so that got me really interested in, in what is actually happening and taking a, a closer look and doing my own personal research with regards to this one specific facility I used to work at. Um, you can kind of see the nuances take shape. And I feel like it's so multifaceted and there's so many parties that play at the same time that makes it very interesting to study. Um, on top of that, I am a huge advocate of quality care and efficacious care. And I think that what's offered here and now is just not that. I think what we're kind of admitting to and submitting to is is kind of the status quo of because there's no better option, we're just going to offer this. So that's what really propelled me to study this and and look into this a little bit more. Great. And so tell me about some of the specific experiences about uh, what was going on, what the abuses, particularly with the vulnerable population, uh, obviously with addiction, are not thinking clearly. Yeah, I mean, I think it starts from the, the money aspect of it all. Um, I think um, some of the things that I saw firsthand were this activation, like this repeated activation of commercial policies, uh, specifically commercial PPO policies, under this humanitarian guise of we're going to give you all a scholarship to get care. Um, so patients weren't known to have these specific commercial policies. And I think that was a huge issue as far as malpractice is concerned. Uh, Additionally, there was this interstate brokering that was happening. So clients were kind of being passed on from brokers in Florida to middlemen um, anywhere between Florida and Pennsylvania, essentially. And then finally, when they got to our facility, there was this kickback routine that happened along every single person that was kind of involved in the transfer of that client. Um, In addendum to that, um, I noticed myself feeling like I was simply a placeholder while working at this specific facility. Um, everything I was clinically trained to do kind of was over, kind of overstepped. Um, my clinical judgment was kind of brushed under the rug a lot of times, um, solely for the interest of not disrupting the billing cycle of the facility. 
again, and I think that was a huge misstep and um, a huge issue with regards to client care. Uh, most clients that were in treatment kind of needed a higher level of care or um, kind of were aware that this wasn't the correct facility for them, but they kind of got gridlocked uh, in this in the system. And um, we couldn't really we couldn't really do anything. Everything that we were trying to do was completely brushed under the rug. What are some of the things we can look at uh, from clinicians looking to refer? Because I know there are many facilities, both for behavioral health, uh, not that I like to separate it, but that's kind of the standard behavioral health versus addiction is, you know, when I talk to facilities, I'm asking a lot of specific direction of what type of training certifications. And if it's not there, who at the top is doing the trainings? And it's very much lacking, particularly trauma care. You know, you hear a lot of trauma informed. You hear a lot of these broad kind of strokes. But when you get down and ask the details of, you know, what type of treatment are and the efficacy to which you can apply it, uh, I seem to hit into walls a lot. So I wonder if you could speak to that a little bit and then uh, I'll hold off on my next question. No, that's a beautiful question. I mean, I, I cannot emphasize enough. Um, ask as many questions as you possibly can. Do your own individual research. If you see broad strokes being applied, like colloquial terms of evidence-based efficacious treatment, um, even a la carte options like equine therapy, not to not equine, but if they offer a, a host of amenities that aren't necessarily evidence-based or there's no research to support that specific modality, continue pressing, continue asking questions. Feel free to ask questions with regards to the owners and operators of the facility. Um, typically transparency is key. If they are unwilling to share details about the clinical experience or the training that the owners and operators have, that should be a red flag. Um, in addendum to that, ask specific questions about the client to uh, clinician ratio. Um, typically that's supposed to be 12 to one as, as opposed to, that's what the books typically say. But, you know, if they, if they seem to be sketchy in any way, shape or form, you know, th those should all be red flags. In addendum to that, I think trying to find a clinician in the area, PhD, PsyD, whatever the case may be, that has longstanding history of providing this specific type of care, asking for their specific feedback and recommendation is always key as well. Uh, that's what I typically recommend folks to do at this juncture as well, just because we want someone with some sort of credibility to stand forth and say, okay, this is a correct facility. Um, the caveat to all of these suggestions is that there are so many of these types of facilities opening up that we have to be hyper cautious and hyper vigilant with where, with where we're going to be attending or where we're sending our local. So how do you know what's adequate? What's good enough? And, and so that's kind of the where I'm at right now with regards to studying. Um, what I found, um, and I'm going to reference a, a, a movie I watched uh, called The Business of Recovery by Greg Horvath. And he kind of looked at a lot of the main stakeholders, the main operators of drug and alcohol treatment, and every single one of them are quoting these statistics that they're 80% efficacious. Um, I personally have done evidence-based studies on this specific facility that I reported on, and it was horrible. It was less than 10% efficacious with 30 to 60 days of sobriety. So I think here and now, nothing is enough. I think just broad stroking, most of the treatment facilities don't really have any evidence to support that they're efficacious. And if they are saying they are efficacious, they need to be providing that information to NIDA or you know, publicizing that information in a very verifiable way. Um, and so I, as, as a consumer myself, I would say that you know, most of these facilities that are opening and operating are not as efficacious as they claim to be. So who sets these standards? I know here in Pennsylvania, at least, uh, the opioid crisis was very big. We created, just like everybody else trying to do something, something called the Opioid Alliance. It only went so far. We are doing education. Uh, but we're also looking to, how do you measure success? I will say, th thanking Pennsylvania and Governor Wolf is, uh, they've created, this, and I only know this because we, we helped create it uh, with them, is a CBT for addiction program where the state of Pennsylvania, at least, will be implementing uh, training for CBT, where they get the very basic level, then they give a didactic approach where it's a small classroom and education, and then actually recording of tapes and uh, to verify the clinicians. And this is at all levels, because we know in addiction, it's not just master's level and lower level. And so I'll commend Pennsylvania for putting uh, you know, their money where their mouth is and trying to do that. But I don't know, there are other states doing this. What is the standard to pick? Uh, pick a clinician, pick a state uh, or a facility. What do you do? 
Yeah, I mean, I think that's where we're kind of stuck here. I think this is where the gap in the literature actually exists. I think Pennsylvania, to your point, is absolutely on the front line of that um, and, and actively and attentively doing something that we can start monitoring and start researching to provide evidence forward to move forward. Um, but from what I know, I know that SAMHSA was the number one pioneer of actually regulating what is open and what is not open. I know in the previous administration, they lost funding. Um, and I know that NAMSL was uh, the National Alliance for uh, Model Safe Drug Laws was also involved in sort of providing like um, some sort of legal um, ramifications and, and setting the bar essentially for some of these facilities. But again, they also lost funding. So I think that's where we kind of are right now is, is the gridlock system of we don't know where to begin um, because responsible entities have lost funding and we don't necessarily know which way to go at this juncture. Um, and it really is haphazard. Um, and I don't think there's enough oversight with regards to these facilities. I know the Department of Drug and Alcohol Programming caught some hot water over all of this as well. Um, but we really need to look at this and do some more avid research. I'm going to support some of the facilities in which, you know, oftentimes they're using lower level training, trained clinicians for, I believe, a more complex client that needs higher training. Uh, and, and part of that, I wonder, is kind of the the stigma following this ladder of societal stigma reaching to the those that make policy be uh, the insurance policies or the legislature. So then they don't fund it properly. So then it squeezes individuals to how to make it work. So how do people make it work looking for to get the proper training, uh, evidence based training to be able to implement it, to be able to measure it, to be able to uh, achieve it and sustain it and then and then get people down the path. How do you work that within the current system in a way that the economics uh, we know people taking advantage in one way, but those trying to do well aren't making it all also. That is the, the golden question, honestly. Uh, I don't know if I have the answer for it, but my hypothesis would be to change the system. Because um, I think the, the ecosystem that we currently exist in with regards to treating substance use disorder just doesn't work. Um, I don't think that it's efficacious enough. I don't think there's evidence behind it. Um, a lot of it is based off of hypothesis as to how things are supposed to work, um, based off of theories of psychiatry that aren't necessarily fully founded yet. Um, we have a very basic understanding of psychiatry as is and, and trying to apply a specific model of care to something that's extremely complex, uh, to your point, um, is, 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 is not fundable right now, you know what I mean? Um, so I think we need to start from the ground up and think about something a little bit more out of box, um, maybe even venturing backwards and starting from individualized care, meaning one-on-one -on -one therapy, and then building back up um, to reframe and restructure the entire system as it is. No, I hear you. Uh, there's a lot of these, and I wonder all the time the, the balance of biology based upon addiction because of the chemistry that's involved with the brain, and is that why the therapeutic side, the therapy side doesn't work? And I know there's some good literature to support that the outcomes are better, although they're not spectacular, but using uh, pharmacology along with it, uh, particularly with technology. And what are your thoughts about technology? Because one of the things here in Pennsylvania is everybody allowed everything to happen during the pandemic, accessed, improved, uh, we're just getting people to maintain, and it wasn't because I think the treatments were any any worse, but the level of stress due isolation and pandemic, and uh, we know addiction went up, and we know it, the rug is about to be pulled out uh, mm -hmm. here in just a few days, if not, I think, today. And so we know that uh, treatment's going to change uh, and access is going to change. Uh, what are your thoughts about that? Yeah, I mean, I, I have colleagues that work in the uh, tele-substance use disorder uh, industry, and, and even at in a, in a systemic sense. Um, and all of them are kind of attesting to that point is that most of the most of the individuals that are participating are having higher incidence of, of actually showing up. Then again, transitively, there's higher incidences of relapse and everything of that sort. But I think tech is an interesting aspect to sort of uh, interplay here. Um, but again, I don't think we're caught up with the research to figure out exactly how to put the pieces together and make it efficacious. Speaking of being an advocate, we know that sometimes that is difficult, right? Uh, it can be, I'm, I'm sure even some of the things that you saw were very traumatic for you as a clinician. So could you speak to a little bit about how some of our listeners, you know, maybe if advocacy is not something that they are familiar with, but they want to get started or they see things that are concerning, you know, what piece of advice do you have for them? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. I think 
the onus falls on us. Um, as I mentioned before, like I think we're in this carcinogenesis stage and Malcolm Gladwell tipping point, if you will. But I think if, if we ourselves are agents of social change as counselors, social workers, whatever our background is, and we don't abide by that and we don't stand up and speak up and say something, then we are participants of that carcinogenesis. And for me, I am not one to cause trouble. I'm not one to step forward. I completely understand and can empathize with anyone not feeling like they're that person. Um, but again, it goes back to that tenant of, if we wanna see change for our clients, if we wanna see change for the system, then we have to kind of step forward and do something and stop this thing from taking over the entire country essentially. Very wise words. We appreciate that very much. Well, thank you so much, Kapil, for being here with us today. Uh, we do look forward to, you know, for the research that you're doing surrounding the answer to that golden question, so to speak. So please do stay in touch with us and, uh, you know, continue to work towards changing the system, as you had, had mentioned before. We thank you very much for all of your efforts. Cheers. Thank you so much for having me. Wonderful. And thanks to our listeners for tuning into this week's episode of The Barrier Breakdown. We hope that you all join us again next week and stay safe and healthy. Take care. Thank you for listening to The Barrier Breakdown, Disrupting Mental Health. Listeners can find all of our episodes on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Podbean. For more information and to learn about upcoming continuing education events, check out our website, cbicenterforeducation.com, our Facebook pages, Cognitive Behavior Institute and CBI Center for Education, as well as our Instagram at Cognitive Behavior Institute and our Twitter at CBI underscore Pittsburgh. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. We hope you'll tune in for another guest next week.